And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our next moderator, Dr. Stormy Annika Mildner. She is the head of the Foreign and Economic Policy Department at the Federation of German Industries. And besides that, she will be my successor at the helm of the Aspen Institute starting the 1st of January next year. And she is also having an impressive academic and professional background, having been board member of the executive board of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, being a lecturer at the John F. Kennedy Institute and the Hertie School, and having been a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund Transatlantic Academy. Her main interests are transatlantic trade and international finance and transatlantic relations. Stormy, it's very good to have you. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Rudi, uh, Rudi, Rudiger. And it's so nice to be here. Um, indeed, this is uh, my first um, event at the Aspen Institute as not yet quite, quite yet uh, director. Um, it's, uh, Rudiger is still on the steering um, seat, um, but it's lovely to be here um, today nonetheless. Um, we have an excellent um, panel lined up, um, and the title of our panel is um, AI Typhons and Tech Tycoons. And um, our speakers today, our um, panelists, are Björn Böning. He's the Permanent State Secretary, Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. Um, Björn, so nice to have you here. Um, where are you currently? Are you at home or are you at your office? I'm the ministry today, but um, partly uh, two days a week I'm at home. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for being here. This is one of my first hybrid sessions um, we are actually doing after lots of days um, at the home office. Um, so it's, it's, ni it's, ni it's nice to see you virtually. It would be nicer to have you all of you here, but maybe... Um, Hopefully soon um, we can all see each other again. Our second panelist is Carl Benedict Fry. He is a Oxford Martin City um, Fellow, University of Oxford, and he um, published or he authored the book "The Technology Gap: Capital, Labor, and Power in the Age of Automation." Carl, where are you currently? I'm currently at my home in Oxford, where I've been most of the time since February. So it's very good to be with you. Nice to see some. Faces. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, is this the window behind you or is that a photo you screened into your video? It, it's not my wallpaper, sadly, and it's not the real background. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. All right. <laughs> the world we're living in. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'm seeing that Eva also joined us. Um, thanks so much for being here with us today um, and for joining us. Um, and let me also introduce um, Eva Maydell to you. Um, she's member of the European Parliament, EPP coordinator um, for the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age. Um, Eva, thanks so much for being here today. And we don't see your um, picture yet. So I hope we can figure that out. Oh, there, there it comes. Um, thanks so much uh, for being here today. Are you at your office or are you at home? <coughs> Uh, hi, good afternoon, and excuse the slight hiccup, but it seems like now it's all working and my video is on. Um, I'm joining from my office, and as we have uh, mentioned, perhaps, I'm actually simultaneously on two meetings. I'm not participating in the other one uh, yet, but I might for uh, two minutes at some point have to participate in that other meeting, and, and then I'll close it. But I um, am going to be fully focused, mm. apart from that two minutes, to our discussion today. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much um, for doing this. Um, and I know that it's challenging. Um, we all do multitasking. We do multi-scheduling. We schedule the events one to the other. So I very much appreciate um, that you are here today with us. Um, then also with us today is uh, Kaspar Klinge. He's Vice President, European Government Affairs, Microsoft Corporation. And um, where are you currently? Yeah, I'm afraid this is not my apartment or my house. So I'm actually in a Microsoft uh, office. Normally, I sit in, in Brussels, not too far away from Eva. But uh, because of the lockdown, I'm actually in uh, in exile in Copenhagen. So in, in Microsoft in Copenhagen. But great to be with all of you. 
It looks like a very impressive uh, backdrop you have there. Um, thanks so much for being with us today. And also with us is Andrew Wyckoff. He's the director, director for science, technology, and innovation um, of the OECD. Um, and um, you are at your office, or you have a very impressive background at home. <laughs> uh, thanks, Stormy. Good to see everyone. Uh, no, I'm I'm at home with my virtual background as mm. well. A little bit OECD like, but. So it goes. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for um, all of you being here. Um, we want to talk about AI today um, and how it changes um, our lives, how we work, how we produce, how we communicate with each other, and all the challenges um, which come along with AI, but also um, the great opportunities. And I couldn't imagine a better panel um, today how we want to structure our dialogue so that also our audience know what they can expect. Um, we have about until um, about 4.45 um, for our discussion among each other. Um, and then I would very much like to open it up, up for Q&As. Um, our team, are um, they take care that the, Q and A, the Qs are going to come to me, the questions, and then I'm going to pass them on um, to you. So let me start with, um, with Bjorn. Um, the, in the last years, um, we saw that the productivity gains um, were mostly driven by technological advancements and that there is an um, increasing disconnect between labor and productivity gains. Um, and I wanted to ask you um, how you see the role of AI in this, what that means for the labor force, um, if AI um, is a positive driver um, or also can create some challenges and what we have to do about it. Well, first of all, um, uh, hello um, to everybody and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining me and having me here. Um, <clears throat> well, um, first of all, I was mentioned that I'm not totally convinced that it's true that um, the economic productivity is only technology driven. It is um, human and machine driven. I think that is uh, quite um, nearer to the situation that we are following. And um, so for us, uh, three issues are uh, main importance, especially in these times that we have. Uh, first of all, um, if I'm right that we are talking about humans and machines, mm. uh, then it's uh, necessary to invest uh, each euro into the technology, also invest uh, in human uh, knowledge and uh, human education. Uh, so for us, um, it's quite important that we have uh, similarity between technological investments and uh, maybe human investments. And uh, so for that, uh, we in Germany think that we need um, uh, a, a human-centered approach of uh, artificial intelligence um, that leads uh, that um, issue that I mentioned. Um, the second thing is, um, if we want to um, yeah, develop um, a leading market of uh, artificial intelligence in the world as European Union. We need a common AI strategy in, within the European Union mm -hmm. that differentiate from the only market model that we um, can see in the US and the only state-centered model that we uh, see in China. So uh, for us, I think we need a regulatory framework that um, uh, is based um, on uh, risk-averse um, approach, and we need um, a regular framework that is common for all the companies uh, that are working in Europe, um, besides they are Chinese, US, or European companies. And so I think um, this must be uh, one main, um, um, main approach of the European Commission uh, next year. And the third thing is that there are um, uh, good and bad approaches if we are talking about the development of AI technology within the, uh, the companies. Um, uh, if we uh, want to find good conditions uh, for uh, technology to be implemented in the companies and uh, to work with technology productively, then we need um, um, an approach of trust within the companies and uh, we need a participation framework um, uh, that uh, workers can um, deal with the technology, with the development of technology, and 
um, participate and co-determinate um, um, uh, if we are talking about um, uh, development of uh, technology uh, on the company level. So for Germany, uh, co-determination uh, is one main aspect um, if we are talking about um, uh, yeah, a modern regulatory flexible framework uh, for artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Björn, for also uh, challenging our assumption. <laughs> I would like to ask a quick follow-up follow question. Um, in many countries, we are seeing an, an increasing income gap. And um, in many countries, social mobility um, has decreased um, over, the last, over the last years. Um, do you think that this uh, could intensify with, um, artificial, with the developments in artificial intelligence, or is there also a chance um, which might help us to, to, um, well, to decrease the income gap again? Well, um, I agree. Um, uh, according to our um, uh, uh, according to our research findings, we know that over the next five years, 1.4 million jobs will be lost only in Germany, and 1.3 million uh, jobs uh, will be um, uh, will be created. And so we have, um, um, yeah, we could um, come into a mismatch between um, uh, people who are in one uh, one side uh, of um, of the economic uh, uh, economy. Uh, where they do not have any chances anymore. And on the other side, we will need um, uh, skills workers um, uh, to work with all the new technology uh, things that we are um, 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 that we um, see. So um, the most important strategy for Germany, and I think also for Europe, uh, is to avoid that mismatch and um, to, um, uh, to find productive ways to um, retrain and uptrain and reskill workers um, uh, due to the technology uh, technological development. Uh, thanks so much for pointing it out that the markets are great, but sometimes the markets don't solve everything. But there need to be um, government policies, um, and that's that's a good keyword um, to ask Carl about industrial policy. Um, what are what are countries, what are governments currently doing, and where where are they putting um, the emphasis? I'm looking at the European Union. We talk a lot, a lot about. Um, the business-to-business -business, um, approach and IE um, in, in business um, and how we produce. In other countries, there's a lot of B2C, um, so business to consumers. So what, in your opinion, is the right approach? What should um, governments foster, um, support, and how can they do it um, in a good way? First of all, thank you very much, Soma, and thank you to the Aspen Institute. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today and being part of such a distinguished panel. I think the question you asked is a very important and timely one. Industrial policy and AI strategy is clearly having um, a revival. And I think a problem is that a lot of people mean very different things when they speak about industrial policy. So when economists think about industrial policy, for example, they tend to think about you know, um, policies that try to change the structure of the economy by either subsidizing some industries, mm -hmm. offering some uh, sort of protection. And looking at the sort of impact of these policies historically, we can see that they have had some success arguably in some countries. In Germany in the 19th century, when Germany caught up with, the, uh, with Britain, uh, it's clearly pursued a much more state-led development model than Britain did. Uh, more recently, Japan, um, as well as many of the Asian tiger economies, plus China, have pursued quite aggressive uh, industrial policies. And, and I think there's a case to be made that in countries like Japan, uh, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry uh, played an important role in driving uh, that catch up. But I think it's also important to remember that as Japan approached the world technological frontier, its job got a lot harder. And Japan completely missed the shift from hardware to software, for example. And, and industrial policy in the end is basically designed to catch up. Uh, it's designed to give companies and industries breathing space uh, until they are fit to face competition. But if you already are at the technological frontier, or if you're in a field which is still not entirely developed and that's is still at an experimental stage, there are diminishing returns to 
these type of policies. And I think it's important to remember that artificial intelligence is not yet a mature technology. Even in the United States, less than 2% of companies have adopted some sort of machine learning. Hmm. Productivity growth, as you mentioned, is in decline. Even the largest US companies are not contributing as much to productivity growth as the largest US companies did 50 years ago. And the reason for this is that artificial intelligence is not yet sufficiently good to have a widespread impact or a meaningful impact on productivity growth. We will need a, not, need a, a lot more innovation to um, be able to harness the gains from AI more broadly. Um, so I think it's important to remember that when we talk about AI strategy, what we really should be talking about is not sort of industrial policy, but more innovation policy. Um, and um, I think here it is probably more instructive to look at frontier economies that have been doing well. And the frontier economy that has been doing the best over the past 150 years is uh, unquestionably the United States. And I think the reason that the United States has been technology leader uh, for such a long time is A, it has the best funded research institutions in the world. Uh, it's not uh, even close if you compare the sort of top US institutions to those in Europe and elsewhere. Secondly, it has a very well developed venture capital um, industry. Even many of the European startups are funded by uh, American venture capital industry. And the government played an important role in creating that, it should be said, with the Small Business Investment Act of 1958. Thirdly, uh, the US has a huge harmonized internal market, and we're trying to create one of those in the United States, uh, in the Europe as well, and have done so quite successfully with regard to goods. We need to do more to harmonize regulation across um, countries when it comes to digital services as well, in order to allow European businesses to scale up the way American businesses um, are able to scale up. Um, and finally, the United States did pursue quite aggressive uh, policies when it came to uh, funding basic research and development in the 50s and 60s, and that to some extent, you know, lay the foundations for the ICT uh, revolution now. So there's a clear case to be made that funding basic research has very valuable spillovers, um, and that is something uh, where a lot more can be done in Europe as well. Uh, right now, we're actually seeing a narrowing down in AI research. Ten years ago, AI used to be a field with the, where there was an anarchy of methods um, with very different approaches to artificial intelligence, getting almost equal funding. Mm -hmm. Now, all the big players are essentially very narrowly focused on deep learning, which is the most data-intensive approach to artificial intelligence. And my worry is that we might see a lock-in into this particular field of intelligence until, unless we try to broaden the scope uh, of AI research again. So you might think, for example, in the 1900, electric vehicles and uh, gasoline-powered vehicles were almost um, you know, uh, as good. Um, along came huge oil discoveries, um, along with some incremental improvements to the internal combustion engine, which tipped the balance. We're now trying to get back into electric vehicles again. And I think to you know, avoid that situation of getting the lock-in into the wrong sort of AI, we need to use science policy to fund other approaches to AI, whether it's probabilistic models, symbolic AI, some recombination um, of all of these. And the EU can uh, play a very significant role there. So just to sum up quickly, I think if you want to use industrial policy, that's geared to catching up. And if you do that, you will always be you know, uh, behind and trying to close the gap to the frontier. If you focus more on innovation policy, you can actually lead and be a significant player in the field. And I think broadly speaking, that is what Europe should do. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for also um, specifying that we might not always talk about the same thing when we talk about industrial policy. Um, if I th think about France, we think about national champions. 
if I'm looking at um, the UK, it's more innovation policy. Germany, it's maybe right in the middle. And we have the same when we talk about sovereignty. We also understand different things about sovereignty. So thank you so much for specifying this. I think we have to come back to this, um, where sovereignty, autonomy um, starts and where it ends and where government policies should start and where sh they should end. Let me now come to um, Eva, because I know that you also have to skip to um, your other meeting um, very quickly. And and um, since Carl already um, mentioned um, the international sphere and cooperation and competition and also the different sphere of internal policies and the external, the international um, sphere, this is exactly what I wanted to ask you about. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about um, European policies, um, the issue of internal cohesion and international competition and how that works together. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to chip in on, on, on that point. Well, first of all, um, I think the way uh, we have to uh, look at the topic in Europe is more focusing on uh, the ecosystem that we could uh, create. Uh, because um, on one hand, if you look at the AI white paper, you would see that we're speaking about excelling in excellence. On the other hand, you would see that we are, want to excel in trustworthy AI. Um, but the underpinning principle is whether we will be able to, um, you know, kind of come out of a comfort zone, which generally tends to have a narrative that we would either regulate about big companies vis-a-vis -vis small companies um, and is this a legislation for European companies or international companies and it's a very political debate but from polit from being a political debate it also gets into being actually a practical debate here in this house and I think what we have to focus a little bit more is trying to get the right mix of an ecosystem um, where um, it's not about the bigger companies but it's about the bigger companies that need the smaller companies and vice versa. Um, and I think we need to try to address where the misbalances are, uh, but we should not create some new type of misbalances of a new kind. And we uh, definitely do need uh, to have certain type of regulation and new regulations, uh, but this regulation should aim to foster innovation in Europe, should aim to make us excel in areas such as AI while creating trustworthiness. That's why we need the regulation and not just for protectionism um, reasons. Um, in the AI white paper, we have a very good agenda for basically the things we need to think about when trying to develop artificial intelligence in Europe. Um, when it comes to data, when it comes to innovation, as I, as, as I mentioned, when we focus on SMEs, on skills, um, to develop those right type of ecosystems and address also societal risk. Um, and I think there's also a very uh, underlying work that needs to be that needs that needs to be that needs to be done. Um, and accelerated, such as data, for example, uh, processing uh, capabilities and, and connectivity. Um, but I think what is important is that this digital policy is no longer just something that few people uh, want to excel in Europe, and this could be their, you know, uh, policymakers in national parliaments or European parliaments. I think uh, with this commission presidency and the College of Commissioners, the digital policy is a little bit more elevated, even within the council, even within the head of states and governments. Could it be even more? Could it be even a bigger priority? Of course it should, and I think it has been, um, it should have been even earlier earlier, uh, because only if it's a true priority of European leaders, we would be able to excel, we'll be able to make sure that is indeed a trustworthy um, uh, technology that we want to uh, develop. Um, and if we look a little bit uh, back, I think the truth is that we missed the opportunity to create uh, some of this momentum uh, with the previous uh, crisis. Basically, what we missed to do is to change the structure of capital investment in Europe, to increase the share 
layers of ICT. Um, and today we are presented with two opportunities. And, and one of them is the current pandemic that we are faced with, which changes us and pushes us to change both the economic and soci societal um, way of doing things. And technology could be a, a, a basis for doing that, but we need to advance uh, into it. And secondly, I think where we are pushed to, to go forward uh, and not just bounce back, but actually bounce forward um, out of the pandemic is the AI and data breakthroughs that are happening. Uh, it gives us a chance uh, to be back in the global competition while in the same time having in mind that Europe produces enormous amounts of industrial data. Um, and we need to find a way of how to make sure that this data is reused, it's maybe in the first time used uh, and then uh, reused and it serves a certain uh, purpose. Um, I think, and I'll conclude with this, that understanding and addressing the current challenges that are faced by businesses, it will be absolutely key to ensure that Europe realizes this economic potential of AI to its fullest uh, extent. And this is precisely uh, what we'll try to do also in the special committee of AI in the digital age. We would like to make sure that this committee it doesn't just tackle topics related to AI that we've been talking on for the past five years, but it actually addresses um, areas uh, where we could excel in the years to come. It addresses topics where we would might need to legislate if necessary, um, and it uh, kind of focuses on, on a forward-looking uh, debate, if I may say so. So I will stop here, but I'm very happy to elaborate later also on uh, how we see the role of the committee. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Do you have to skip to your other meeting, or can I ask one follow-up question? I think I'm still safe, but the next point is mine on the agenda. So I'll be short in answering Okay, very your short. Okay. Um, so you mentioned SMEs, um, that they are still sometimes struggling with AI. Um, and I won wondered if you have a um, best case um, which you could share with us where you would uh, say, this is how we should uh, get um, small and medium enterprises also more on board. Well, I think uh, the best example is um, using uh, that industrial data that we have in Europe to be used by SMEs um, and to be deployed in their daily operations. So it's not just about, you know, COVID-19 might have pressed the digital bottom uh, seriously uh, ahead of us. Uh, to to basically for for us to move forward, but not just because of Zoom meetings, right? We want to change the way processes and operations work. So I think data uh, would be the one area where SMEs could definitely uh, be uh, empowered uh, to to truly excel. Thank you so much. Um, one, one of the questions which I already got through the Q&A and which also um, Eva um, mentioned or touched upon is AI during the, um, during the crisis, the pandemic, um, how it can help us um, tackle the pandemic, um, but also uh, prevent coming ones. Um, that is a question we should keep in mind for our discussion and for our Q&A session. Um, but first, let me come now to Casper. To After we heard um, the government and the parliament's uh, point of view and also the academic point of view, now I'm also very curious um, uh, to hear the, the, um, the company point of view. Um, and we talked a little bit about the international sphere already. And there seems to be an, a race, an AI race, um, where it's not always, I mean, there's a lot of competition, not always collaboration and cooperation. And I'm just thinking about the systemic competition between the United States and China. Um, also, the new opportunities for cooperation, maybe, between the European Union and the United States. And um, maybe, Casper, maybe you can tell us a little bit, um, share your view on where we are heading. So how many hours do I have to respond to these many <laughs> different topics? <laughs> <laughs> No, listen, I think you know, thanks a lot for, for having me. And um, I rarely disagree with Eva on anything. So I might repeat a couple of the points that you made uh, previously. I, I think the first point I want to make is, make is that 
you know, the AI revolution is not, is not something that happens overnight, right? It, it's sort of a gradual process as these technologies become more and more efficient, whether we call it machine learning or AI, it doesn't really matter. I think what we need to acknowledge is that the economy is going to be data-driven. And what we see also from, from our point of view is that this is not just a question of big enterprises or small enterprises or medium-sized enterprises. You know, we really have to make sure that we digitalize and we enable uh, every single sector, every single industry uh, taking advantage of these uh, new technologies. And, you know, since we are at least virtually in, in Germany, I thought I wanted to give you a couple of examples. But the first one with, with SAIS, um, it's a partnership we have with them in Germany, where we're actually looking at how can, how can our platforms, how can our cloud solutions enable a data-driven approach to, to healthcare. And this is about better diagnostics. It's about maintenance of, of medical equipment. It, it's really about taking a, a 21st century approach to healthcare and, and, and how, uh, how that is, is approached uh, in Germany, but also more widely. But I think there is sometimes this misconception that AI or machine learning primarily is to the advantage of big companies. And when we look at our own data sets internally, it's actually crystal clear. If you look at, 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 at the advantage of going into the cloud and using uh, you know, the cloud for, for, for companies, the, the biggest advantage is actually for, for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. So I think that's an important uh, dimension of it. And um, zooming a little bit out, um, I think the interesting bit here is what, what Eva already mentioned that will we see more regulation coming in the area of artificial intelligence? I think the answer is yes. Will it come tomorrow? I think the answer is no on that. It'll take some time. We know that the European Commission will come forward with uh, with the proposal uh, at the beginning of the new year, but it'll probably take a couple of years before that will have an impact um, or will, will, will come into effect after going through the parliament, the national parliaments, et cetera. But I think the what we've seen in the contours of, of, uh, of the proposal is very promising. It's about focusing on high risk areas. You know, in Microsoft, we've been advocating that we need to take a look on, on facial recognition, just to take one example. Mm -hmm. But I would also say highly sensitive personal data in the healthcare space is certainly areas where we need to be very careful on how we how we use data. Um, our business model is you know crystal clear. We don't use our customers' data. We don't have access to it. I wouldn't even call us a platform. I think we enable our customers to develop their own platforms and really take advantage of these new uh, technologies. But we do need a regulatory framework. And I think in the interim, until we have European regulation in place, this is where I think we all need to make sure that we self-regulate, that we bring forward these new technologies in a responsible way. And uh, because of my, my good friend Andy is probably speaking next, I, I want to say that what the OECD did a, a, a little while ago on, on developing principles for AI, in our view and in my view, I think is a super important uh, way forward. I know we're short on time, so just before wrapping up, I just wanted to touch on, on the last point that you made, the transatlantic uh, relationship, because I do think that this is a value-driven uh, you know, question. We, we have to make sure that we defend democracy, that we defend privacy, that we enable uh, you know, economic growth, uh, et cetera. And I think what is really encouraging is that for those of you who, who might have read uh, the European Commission's communique that came out last week, on a, a US-EU um, agenda, um, a co collaboration agenda for, for global change. I think there were many, many uh, good examples on, on deliverables for a Biden administration working together with Europe. But one of the areas was actually a proposal to establish a transatlantic AI agreement that was fundamentally focused on ring fencing uh, the values that I think we share across, uh, across the Atlantic. But I think it is the, these kind of of global approaches, if you like, uh, that also a company like Microsoft would, would definitely uh, focus on and uh, and think are a positive uh, way forward. But in the interim, I think you should all expect and demand and hold companies like Microsoft accountable so that we move forward with technology that is uh, responsible and that ultimately benefits uh, societies. And we haven't spoken about a lot about COVID-19. I think the response to COVID-19, big scale, small scale, has been a fundamental demonstration on how important 
new technology is, but also how important machine learning and artificial intelligence is already as of today. I'll, I'll finish here in, in uh, being conscious about the, the limits of time, and I want to make sure we listen carefully to, to what Andy has to say as well. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and you already an anticipated my follow-up question, which I wanted to ask you about the Commission's uh, communique on the transatlantic relationship. So thanks so much for anticipating this. My apologies this, for that. <laughs> <laughs> this way I can hand over directly to Andy um, and ask about the, uh, your Andy's uh, view and the OECD view um, on artificial intelligence and um, how we have managed um, the current crisis, how it actually was or is a push um, for more development in the uh, uh, arena in the sphere of AI and if we are really using it sufficiently um, to tackle the challenges which are ahead of, ahead of us. Um, thanks and thanks Casper for setting me up. Um, it, I've been looking at this area for a very long time back to when I was advising the U.S. Congress 25 years ago and just it, COVID does represent quite a significant change. I don't know if we can fully appreciate exactly what's going on here until we step back and get a little bit of distance, but it, it, it's clear that we're seeing just this, you know, jump in data flows of 60% across the networks in Japan and the UK. Um, business models changing overnight, such as those of uh, the OECD even, who would have thought, uh, as we move to a much more of a hybrid um, in environment, and that's true across the board. You see small, medium enterprises quickly, actually nimbly in some cases, moving towards uh, an e-commerce uh, approach to doing, doing work. It, it's very uneven. As Casper said, if you're in the cloud business, you're, you're doing well. Uh, if you're in the uh, other businesses, uh, such as you know movie theaters or large spectator uh, events or, or even uh, anything that enables mobility or travel, uh, big platforms like Airbnb and Uber have have had a, to struggle during during this period. So it's it's very uneven, and with this comes a lot of structural change. And as Carl and others were saying, um, this requires adjustment mechanisms, a lot of which have to deal with skills uh, and new ways of, of adapting and doing business, of which data driven business whether we're at AI or not, I'm unsure. I, I, I kind of agree with some of the uh, comments about we need not to get too far ahead of our skis here. Uh, it, it's gonna take a, a long time to go to completely to an AI uh, environment. That said, it's, it's important. You saw the announcement last week by DeepMind and their ability to use AI to uh, tackle what's been a, a incredibly difficult scientific uh, endeavor the 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 folding of of proteins, which are is a fundamental step forward in thinking through science in in, in these areas. It, it's got great uh, pros, uh, prospects, um, but but with it, we 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 do see these business dynamics changing, which we need to be attentive to. The big do seem to be getting bigger. Uh, they seem to be if you are well poised with both a digital presence already and good financial capabilities, you have done reasonably well. Uh, other sectors that didn't have that are falling behind. And with that comes um, concerns on our part about how to, how to change the regulatory environment to, to help the transition, maybe allow some restructuring, but also to aid some of those firms that are struggling. struggling. Um, again, I, I would just say, we don't know what's gonna be like post COVID. Uh, there's some good, uh, data I saw not too long ago coming out of Italy that suggested that when they eased confinement measures, things actually dropped down, but nowhere near where they were before the crisis began. And I think that's not a bad indication of where, where we're going to be. Um, COVID, just to end, has really put a spotlight on data and its importance to the economy going forward. And as Eva and others have said, I think we need to have more holistic policies here that maybe rise above just the trade view of data and goat negotiations or the data protection authorities view and reach a higher level that begins to look at how it's really gonna become an essential resource um, across the economy. 
And with that comes where Casper ends, which I'd like to just echo his, I think, kind of optimistic note that I think the differences that I've seen across the Atlantic are narrowing. Uh, COVID is, is, is part of the reason for this. And it, I think it even preceded the US uh, election that you had seen more discussions happening um, about how to achieve um, the trade flows that have benefited both regions for, for so long. Again, I, I keep my fingers crossed here that as going forward, uh, those negotiations will uh, advance and we'll get some real outcomes. It may have to be on a regional basis and this is where, and that's where I'll end, where uh, Casper's talking about our AI principles last year. I think those would have been hard to get through a UN body, let's say, but we're very possible in an OECD group of uh, 44 adhering countries. And I think then you can snowball these into other groups. And that's what we did. The G20 took them on and were the basis of their AI principles. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to come back to one of the questions um, uh, of our, one of our audience participants um, about AI um, and pandemic preparedness um, and uh, pandemic management um, and crisis management. I still remember the German G20 presidency when health issues were for the first time really placed on the agenda and the leaders met for a big pandemic um, uh, preparedness scenario um, where they really tried to go through the uh, through the motions, and I also remember um, the Koreans telling about their how they deal with the issue with contact tracing, um, the contact tracing app, and everybody here was saying like, no way, I mean, no way, we are going to do this. So my question to um, all of you um, is, um, are we how much are we currently using a a AI um, in the crisis management? Um, are there also limitations, and where are the, so to say, the trade-offs um, between data protection and, and really crisis management? And who would like to go first? <laughs> Maybe can I hand over to you, Eva, first? Thank you. I'm not sure I know uh, the the answer and I have uh, the data, but I uh, definitely have a little bit at least of information uh, when it comes to how much we are uh, using uh, AI. And I think in most member states or on a European level, we are using AI way too little to predict or to try to forecast uh, the, the certain events similar to the pandemic we are currently experiencing. So I think it's still a big taboo in a number of countries in Europe uh, to uh, analyze big chunks of data and be able to uh, predict measures that you might have to take um, or, uh, you know, certain um, ways of how uh, the wave, whether it be the pandemic or another type of, of, of crisis that could uh, hit us, uh, will develop. And actually, if one looks um, at, at, at some of the, the big analysis of data there there's already been quite a bit of um, studying uh, or especially on the COVID-19 uh, situation and it's just bizarre that some governments are not relying on that uh, and are still very often taking political decisions um, first uh, rather than uh, decisions that are based on, on data. Of course I don't speak for all member states but uh, some uh, definitely uh, could rely better on data and hence come up with more informative and correct decisions. Um, so I think this is also part of this opportunity that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, we have that data and we have the systems. So it's a pity that we are delaying or not using um, the information we have and analyzing it in the right way. And it could come also when it comes to developing medicine that could cure for example, faster in certain situations, AI could be of help, but it has to be uh, something that is also proactively nurtured and, and look forward um, also by institutions in the member states. Maybe we can hear from one of the uh, European member states uh, from Germany. Um, Bjorn, um, do you agree that it's bizarre that we are not using AI more um, in the uh, pandemic um, crisis management? Well, it depends. Uh, if you're talking about our tracing app in Germany, uh, where we have uh, 20, not about 20 million users uh, of the Corona Warn uh, app, so we call it, um, uh, uh, which is 
really successful um, and uh, 1.5 million people were um, uh, called uh, via app uh, that they had contact with um, so-called category one um, uh, COVID-9 um, infected people. And so therefore for that app, we, um, uh, we used a strictly GDPR uh, framework and um, we used also um, a confidence as one, or trust, better say, um, a trust um, framework um, for um, uh, uh, yeah, for merchandise, uh, this and not merchandise uh, for um, uh, for supporting this app, so that people uh, trust this app, trust um, all the maybe back doors that be closed uh, and uh, helped um, the app to be a real successful AI um, uh, project. Now we're talking about, about um, um, yeah, a professional um, app that we, the people can use um, data to inform others. So we just want to um, uh, do, um, yeah, create a better framework for that app, a better technological framework. So it's a, it's a process. But let me mention two other uh, aspects that are important, I think. First of all, what we see uh, in this pandemic is that um, companies that have uh, flexible um, uh, arrangements, that um, have uh, skilled workers, that um, have a professional new work culture within their companies so that uh, workers participate in the technolog technological process. These companies um, in Germany were more successful in that crisis than others. So um, companies that have a strong hierarchical um, uh, leading structure uh, in their companies have big problems to um, uh, um, to um, uh, um, uh, to perform uh, in that pandemic crisis. And so, and this is one main aspect uh, on, on, or a sign for a modern labor market. And the the second thing is. We use AI um, to uh, strengthen our labor monitoring. So we create a strategic foresight on uh, good data uh, so that we can use these data to have a better forecast on uh, the development of the labor market, where we need skilled workers, where we have a structural change uh, in different sectors so that we can um, uh, uh, strengthen our initiatives for further training, uh, for skills monitoring, uh, and um, to give advice to employees and employers, mm -hmm. which are the right strategi strategies um, uh, for further training and, and re- and upskilling. So uh, I think um, AI is also um, um, a, a good way to perform a better labor market policy. Thank you so much. Um, a question just came in um, for Carl, um, Andy um, and Casper. And the question is, you were um, rather optimistic with regard to international cooperation and collaboration and also the transatlantic um, relationship, um, which uh, it's, it's good to hear. Um, but the question goes, um, isn't there still a danger that three different sphere, technology sphere, spheres are going to develop? One in Asia, around China, also with RCEP, the new tr big trade agreement. Um, one in the United States uh, with trading partners. And sometimes, or may maybe you were, you were you in the middle, kind of being squished or being the third uh, uh, sphere, so to say, of regulations and standards. Um, maybe you, all the three of you could explain us, to us a little bit more why you are so optimistic. Andy, would you like to start? Sure. I, I guess my optimism stems a little bit from what Casper was talking about, those AI principles in 2019 during a period when most people had given up on multilateralism. Mm. Somehow we were able to agree at the OEC, 44 countries, three different continents on what are pretty important principles. There's some real teeth to them about transparency and accountability and robustness. And I personally wouldn't have predicted that and, and it happened. And what's more is now those same countries are, are, building on these for to make real implementation efforts. And here we're, we're coordinating closely with the EU and, and their efforts. 
Actually, we benefit a lot from the German Ministry of Labor for our work in this area as, as well. And um, I'm, I'm, it's just on that that I kind of say, well, okay, I, I think people are realizing this is important. Schrems two decision puts some heat behind this as well. I think um, big firms want to resolve this. And I think that brings people closer to the table then than if we had the privacy shield still in operation. All right, um, Carl. Yes, and maybe just to add to that. So I think there is a great value in harmonization and standardization across space. And I very much applaud the efforts of the OECD in that. A little bit of competition can be good as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not, you know, all pessimistic about, you know, the United States and Europe taking slightly different approaches. And in some domains, it teaches us about what works and what doesn't um, as well. And so um, clearly there needs to be convergence in some domains and the work of the OECD um, on that is very impressive, but it doesn't mean that we need to harmonize across uh, the board. And I think a bit of competition is only healthy. And Casper? So you're basically asking a Dane to be a little bit more pessimistic. <laughs> very natural I mean, us. come on, you have a German moderator. Sure, I have to. <laughs> yeah. No, listen, I, I, you know, it, it goes without saying that the discussions in Europe around strategic autonomy and digital mm. sovereignty has different interpretations. Um, and uh, I, I think the first thing we, we, we want to say, and I think both Eva and, and, um, and also Andy and others have sort of indirectly said this as well, there are valid reasons why Europe is preoccupied with becoming better at controlling its own approach to technology and digitalization. I think when you look at, at the global map and you look at where, where technology is being developed, it, it goes without saying that Europe is a slightly smaller spot on the map than perhaps Europe should be when you look at, at the history and the legacy. So also for a company like Microsoft, our approach to this is to acknowledge that this is a valid, it's a legitimate uh, you know, desire, and we see that both in, in the European Commission's uh, Europe Fit for the Digital Age approach, and we've seen it also lately in, you know, the speech from President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, we've seen it also recently in the interview with uh, French President Macron, sort of underlining uh, the importance of strategic uh, autonomy. But I, if we go to, to the Macron speech, I think what is interesting with that uh, interview is that he also underlines that fundamentally this is about Europe's ability to choose for itself. And to choose to collaborate with the ones you want to choose to collaborate with. I think Commissioner Vestager has said that digital sovereignty is to some extent also about regulatory uh, sovereignty, about deciding its uh, the rules and, and the approach to technology in Europe um, in, in a free and, and open way. And I think that is important. What, what I would say um, is, of course, that uh, for us, uh, like many other uh, companies, I think the importance of being able to utilize data is a fundamental aspect of this. Uh, Andy mentioned uh, SRIMS too. I think the ability to transfer data is such a fundamental part of the digital economy. And actually, again, just referring back to the communication that came out of the European Commission a few days ago, I think it's fantastic to see that it's, it's a central paragraph underlining that the US and Europe needs to find ways uh, through the development jointly of enabling uh, data transfer. And if I may dis dis disagree a little bit with Eva, and it doesn't happen very often, and she will give me a hard time for doing this, I'm sure. I think industrial data and the discussion in Europe around industrial data is sometimes a little bit misunderstood because European industrial data is global industrial data in today's world. If you are a German car manufacturer and you are gathering data sets, it does not only come from Europe, it comes from around the world. And it would be detrimental to the ability of a German car manufacturer to monetize those data sets if you do not have, not have the possibility to, to transfer data from around the world. In fact, I know Eva doesn't disagree with me, but I thought I would just say this in a slightly provocative way. So I think the digital sovereignty discussion is, is, um, is, is a legitimate one. We just want to make sure it doesn't end up in a protectionistic way where ultimately this will not benefit European customers, European consumers, and, and, and Europe as such. And we want to be part of that. And as I said, said initially, we don't use our customers' data. We have no interest in it. We don't compete with our customers, but we want to be able to facilitate, including with the state-of-the-art technology, uh, Europe's uh, transition to an even more digital economy. 
Well, thank you so much. If I were not um, an objective neutral moderator, um, but a BDI representative, I would also underline the importance of data transfer also in e-commerce. But coming back to my moderator role, <laughs> um, some of the questions which are coming in are indeed actually focusing a little bit more on the risk side um, of AI. And um, one of the issues being referred to is uh, facial recognition um, and emotion detection um, and how that can be also misused um, by rogue regimes. And I'm just thinking about uh, the Arab Spring, for example, with information technology and also um, the European reform on dual use exports. Um, and the question is, um, is there such a risk, a, a geopolitical security risk? And if so, um, how can we handle this? Who would, who would like to ask, uh, answer this question? Yes, please. Go ahead, Bjorn. We, we have, Bjorn please. May I? Yes, please. So we, we have a discussion in Germany um, about um, this differentiation um, of um, um, yeah, risk averse system. And um, I think uh, that what our German Data, Data Ethic Commission proposed us uh, is, uh, the, is key. Um, they proposed uh, something like a risk pyramid. Um, where we can um, uh, yeah, observe um, different um, developments of AI and different usage of AI. So it's, uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the Data Ethics Commission and the opinion of the German government, um, it's um, uh, not, not really risk um, uh, riskful that um, uh, AI is used in Spotify applications or something, uh, that is no problem. But if you're talking about the usage of AI in, uh, in the health sector um, uh, or in, uh, in autonomous driving, there you have uh, other um, uh, risk um, steps. And uh, that what we can see in, in the pharma sector, um, especially today, if we're talking about the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, we see that there are different um, um, yeah, um, permit scales um, where we can um, um, uh, follow and observe um, uh, something like a risk pyramid uh, framework. And that is our opinion that we can follow that. But I want to just mention that we also have especially if we're talking about face recognition, we also need um, uh, to think about positive usage of face recognition. If we're talking for our as uh, Ministry of Labor, we see uh, that we can prevent uh, occupational um, uh, bad accidents, um, uh, occupational accidents via face recognition. Because we see if people are tired at the, uh, on the shop level, oh, yeah. we can uh, prevent uh, accidents. We can use AI and face recognition for occupational safety and health. And so let's, let's not only think about the risk, Let's also think about the positive aspects where we can use AI to, um, to create better work and better lives. Thank you so much for pointing that out as well. I mean, there's so many positive exa examples for positive usage. And you mentioned um, face recognition and, and uh, machine safety. I'm thinking about driving, for example, where also the car can tell you um, or give a warning sign if you get um, unattentive um, or tired. So I think there are many, many examples. Unfortunately, our time is running out. I would love to... Um, to talk to you for more hours and hours to come. Um, I can't, I'm already getting the, the, the eye from the side, um, but I want to ask you one, one last question. So we are days before um, the Italians take over the G20 presidency and days before the Brits take over the G7 presidency. So, and it's almost Christmas time, so it's time for wishes. So I would like to hear your wish for both agendas what should the leaders talk about um, at their um, up, upcoming G7 and G20 cycles? Um, and let, let me start with Eva, if I may. Thank you very much. Well, um, I am known to often mention in panels how I would like to have a European Council dedicated entirely on the digital advancement of Europe and to have more of those uh, 
so to say, uh, digital leaders. And I, I have to explain, these are not people that have to lead our economies by knowing how to code, but by understanding why it's important to uh, deploy technologies in our daily work. So uh, indeed, it's a simple wish, but it's a very difficult one. It would be very good if there's a certain amount of time and not as a last point on the agenda, uh, that kind of uh, never is enough time for it to be discussed. But it would be very beneficial um, if there's, a, a, you know, an enough emphasis put on the advancement of certain uh, areas when it comes to technological advancement, particular uh, AI and the use uh, of data. Um, it would give a, a good overview that we are not just discussing uh, global politics and external relationships, because it's, after all, the technological debate is embedded in that debate as well. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it is often avoided is because it's not known very well. So that's why I, I wished for us for 2021, more digital leaders, people that do understand technology. Thank you very, very much. Just put the leaders into a room. Don't let them out until they can code. Um, Andy, what's your wish? Uh, first of all, back to my optimism just for a second. I, I, I want to point out that G7 crosses three different continents, as does the G20. But the G7 just had their inaugural meeting of the Global Partnership for AI last week, which has expanded much beyond the G7 partnership to include countries like India and Singapore and so forth. And again, that's, I think I'd love to see the G7 continue on that uh, dimension, maybe moving more broadly to a governance of technology and how to get more uh, proactive instead of reactive. On, on the G20, the, the Italians here, um, I think, as we've been saying, AI is just at its early days to look more at those steps of implementation for the G20 AI principles and what they really mean in areas such as bias and trustworthiness uh, and robustness, I think would be a, a good effort for the Italians. Thank you so much. Casper, uh, you a wish. You know, our motto is that technology runs on trust. So I would, of course, argue that I think we need to take advantage of the global pandemic crisis in driving a more ambitious digital agenda forward, uh, but also avoiding fragmentation. And then I just want to add in sustainability as something that I think works really hand in hand also with the digitalization agenda. So that would be my wish list. Emphasis on avoiding fragmentation and really a strong focus on on, uh, on core values, defending democracy, uh, avoiding biases, uh, human rights, etc. Thank you so much. And Carl? So just to build on what um, Andy said, so I think, I mean, there's been a great push towards more explainable, trustworthy AI. What I would like to see more of is what sort of AI do we need in different domains? So if you want artificial intelligence to develop a vaccine, for example, well, you suddenly need it to be trustworthy but you guess the trustworthiness from testing whether it works or not, not from the AI being explainable. So if you have an unexplainable AI that produces 95% efficacy and an explainable one that produces 50% efficacy, you would rather take the unexplainable uh, vaccine. Uh, if you look at autonomous vehicles, I think we need it to be uh, trustworthy and explainable. If you look at you know producing a AlphaGo, a deep mind could couldn't explain how AlphaGo beat the world's best Go player. It would get the matrix of a lot of weights and probabilities. And frankly, we don't really need uh, that particular task to be explained. So if you try everything to be explained and trustworthy, you also, you know, uh, increasing the cost of innovation, perhaps unnecessarily in some domains. So I think we need to take it one step further and try to think more about in which domains do we need what. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Björn Swish. Yeah, I totally agree that the mentioned uh, global partnership uh, for AI is uh, one wonderful platform. And as German co-chair um, of, um, together with the Ministry of um, Economic Affairs, uh, we wish that the global partnership could uh, do that um, differentiate um, approach that Carl uh, mentioned. Uh, I think um, uh, that would be very um, ne necessary. And on the G20 and G7 um, level, um, my vision my hope is that we 
um, uh, that um, our Italian friends and our British friends uh, will increase um, the investment on reskilling and upskilling uh, worldwide um, so that um, all the um, uh, members of the G7, G7 and G20 uh, think that the further training approaches within their states are the most um, uh, important investment in humans and human beings. Thank you so much to our panelists um, for being here today with us. I think um, you have big wishes. You are big thinkers. I think Center needs a pretty big sled um, to deliver all these wishes. One thing is pretty sure, um, we shouldn't wait for Center. It takes a lot of work to create the right frameworks, conditions, and it's the right approach to get business together with um, government, with independent thinkers. That's the way to do it. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, and Espen is going to be happy um, also for the next coming months and years um, to pick up on all your ideas and continue our dialogue. So thank you very, very much for being here today with us. And with this, it's Rudy's stage you, again. May all your wishes come true. That was a great panel. I think we learned a lot. And with that outlook from you, I think we can continue with our next panel in one and a half minutes. You cut back a little bit on our break, but I think it was worth it. I think it was worth it. So please stay tuned. In one minute, we rejoin with our next panel. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you.